We learned a great deal, of course, during the feast about the millennium, 1,000-year reign of Christ. God's holy days are found in the Bible. The world's holidays are not in the Bible. There are some may try to connect them to the Bible, but they're not really from the Bible. They're not explained there, like we have God's holy days in Leviticus 23 and elsewhere. God's holy days make sense. There's a progression of a plan and a program and a format. They tell a story. They unfold down through history as they're, they're playing out and they're fulfilled. And they really explain the broader good news or gospel message, the good news for mankind of what God is doing and what his plan is and how they can be a part of it and so on. All very, very beneficial to us. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant, in 2 Peter 3, 8, of this one thing. One day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Now, it doesn't say one day is worth 10,000 or one day is worth a million. There is this biblical comparison, an analogy. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. So this is where we look at the parallel of the week, the seven-day week, and compare it to what God is working out here on the earth. And we look at this basic framework and show that there is six days of the week. The seventh day is the Sabbath rest. It's a different period of time. <clears throat> it's not man's day. We have the first six days. The seventh day is holy to God. Mr. Moody actually earlier in the feast had the sermon on the Sabbath day, and that was his topic, the Sabbath of God, God's commandment, the seventh day that he set aside. So we have a parallel. It would appear that mankind is given 6,000 years of human history, his time, his governments, his way, but there'll be a 1,000 year period of time that is God's kingdom, God's time, God's millennial rest, you might say from all the, the turmoil that mankind has been a part of. So the parallel is exact. We look for mankind to be having only 6,000 years. Don't know the exact date, but we know we're coming very near to the end of 6,000 years of recorded uh, biblical and human history. But the question that I was going to ask, and will ask us here today, whatever happened to the millennium? Now, this does not only tie into the feast here, as I ask this question today, but actually tells us a great deal about our church. But whatever happened to the millennium? I mean, the idea of the millennium. Why does the Christian world know almost nothing about it? I certainly didn't in growing up. Never heard such a thing. I've mentioned that to you as well. Didn't know there was going to be Christ coming back to the earth. He was coming back to the earth to destroy the earth with fire. That's what Christ returned. The only thing I knew about Christ coming back to the world. But why isn't every Christian familiar with the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, most people never heard of that. You say you're going to the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Table Knuckles, or what did you say that was? Or It's very strange, very unusual. I'd never heard the term not growing up in the Catholic Church. But why isn't it much more familiar to this world's Christian community? Now, many people hear about Pentecost. That's because the Holy Spirit coming, the book of Acts, chapter 2. So a lot of Christian churches know about Pentecost. <clears throat> not much about Passover. They know Easter and Christmas. That's their religion. Nothing about Tabernacle. Maybe they've heard of atonement and some of the Jews in the Feast of Tabernacle and what it would picture, of course, next to nothing. Now, we're familiar with the scriptures. I won't go through too many of them uh, because we heard them during the feast. Daniel 2, 4, of course, would be, and this great stone comes, takes over the kingdoms of the world. 
sets up a kingdom. Of course, Micah 4 and Isaiah 2. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. We'll learn of his ways. He'll teach us of his law and so on. And they will beat their swords into plowshares. Oh, very, very straightforward. Let's look at 2, Jeremiah three seventeen. Maybe this was not read, was not in uh, New Braunfels. <clears throat> Jeremiah three seventeen. At that time they shall call Jerusalem. Jeremiah three seventeen. Here's one of the many prophecies. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Now, it doesn't say at that time they'll call heaven the throne, and it doesn't say at that time they'll call Rome the throne of the Lord. At that time they'll call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. All nations shall be gathered unto it. They won't, all the nations won't crowd into Jerusalem. They'll be looking to Jerusalem. To the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem, neither shall they walk any more in the imagination of their heart. Verse 18, in those days, the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel. They'll be united once again. They shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance to their father. Well, there's a picture of the millennial reign. Jerusalem is the headquarters. Christ will return to Jerusalem. Feed on the Mount of All, all the many, many verses. Now Luke chapter 22 and verse 30, I'm showing how very clear this concept of the millennial reign of Christ is in old, the Old Testament, so many prophecies, New Testament as well. Luke 22, 30. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus said that to his disciples. You'll be judging tribes of Israel. It's not spiritual. It's not in heaven. It's the kingdom. The kingdom they asked about. Now, they didn't understand the details. Thought Jesus would set up his kingdom immediately. So when he was put to death, they were shattered. They thought he was the Messiah. They thought, when are you going to set up your kingdom, they asked him. And then he's crucified, of all things, dead. They, they watched him be buried. That was the end of the whole, the whole dream. Now what do you do? What a shock it was. Well, Luke 19 was really a clue, but there were so many things that Jesus stated that his disciples didn't pick up on. I, I have meat to eat you know not of. And they, well, who fed you anything? I didn't, we didn't know you had anything to eat. Uh, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. Well, how are you going to do that? It took years to build the, build the temple. Uh, let's go, La Lazarus is asleep. And they said, well, if he's asleep, let him sleep. <laughs> He'll wake up. Let the family wake him up. Why do we need to go there? It's, Lazarus is dead. Oh. So they missed many, many things, statements he made. Luke 19, 11, as they heard those things, he added and spoke a parable because he was close to Jerusalem because they thought that the kingdom of God would immediately appear. And he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive a kingdom and come back. Somebody's going away and they'll be back later. The kingdom's not going to appear immediately. But they didn't get that. They didn't say, oh, okay, we got it. Didn't see any of that. But we know Matthew 5, blessed are the meek, they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Revelation 5, 10 has made unto us our God kings and priests, will reign on the earth. Really not very much of a mystery when you think about the millennium, the rule of Christ established on the earth. Mark in his sermonette uh, at the feast was on Acts chapter 3, the restoration of all things. Remember that prophecy, Acts 3, 19 through 21, heavens must receive until the time of the restitution of all things. Oh, pretty, pretty clear. So whatever happened to that idea? 
Where did it go? Churches don't really recognize it now. The people in the first and second century, they understood that. That was a part of the, their religion, the, the Christian religion. Here's Papias. He's considered a saint by the Catholics, was a, a friend to Polycarp. This you'd find in Eusebius, in his um, history of the church. Papias says there will be a period of a thousand years after the resurrection of the dead and that the kingdom of Christ will be set up in material form on this very earth. Of course. Pretty clear. He knew that. He wasn't in the church, true church. But everybody knew that. What else would they be thinking? None of the early church thought everybody's souls going off to heaven as they die. They're all up there. Nobody thought that. Justin Martyr. Now we're getting into the second century, third century, Justin Martyr, uh, one of the early Catholic church fathers. But I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead in a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built, adorned, and enlarged. The prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah and others declare. Of course we believe that. What else would we believe? Early on. But forces were working against that. Because there's a lot of pagan influence trying to interject itself into true Christianity. A lot of things were held on as we moved, but gradually more and more true doctrines kind of discarded. Now I read to you on, a, I think it was Trumpets, from uh, Gibbons, and I'll read this again, just because it's tying in so well. The, assur the assurance of such a millennium was carefully inculcated by a secession of fathers who conversed with the immediate disciples and apostles. That's what they taught, handed down. Though it might not be universally received, it appears to have been the reigning sentiment of the orthodox believers. And it seems so well adapted to the desires and apprehensions of mankind that it must have contributed a very, in a very considerable degree to the progress of the Christian faith. Christ returning, establishing his kingdom, saints being resurrected. Well, that's so encouraging. He said that probably helped promote the Christian religion. But when the edifice of the church was almost complete, ow, the main church of history, the primary mainstream church, which had been fundamentally the Catholics, but when the edifice of the church was almost completed, the temporary support was laid aside. The doctrine of Christ's reign upon the earth was at first treated as a profound allegory. Well, that's just kind of an allegory for peace and happiness and, and rest. And then was considered by degrees as a doubtful and useless opinion and was at length rejected as the absurd invention of heresy and fanaticism. So as time went on, it was completely discarded and rejected. So fundamentally, through centuries of the Christian church, tabernacles, table knuckles, who knows anything about that? Gradually, the idea of the millennium began to be rejected. Well, this is important to us, not just for the millennium, but we have a religion. We do worship God. Look at John 4, verse 23. We have a religion, not a perfect one by any means, with perfect understanding and perfect people. But we have a religion and a way of worship. From where do we get what we do? Well, we try to get it from the, the scriptures and the Bible. John 4, 23 and 24, the hour comes and now is when true worshipers, there is a true church. There are true worshipers, not perfect people. By any means. Or a perfect church. Not that either. But they're truthful worshipers. will worship the Father in spirit and truth. There's a spirit that guides our heart, our mind, our attitude. And we try to follow what comes from the scriptures, the source of truth. 
For the Father seeks such to worship him. God's a spirit. They that worship him must worship him, not according to human or carnal ideas or sentiments or philosophies. It's the right spirit, spirit of the law and in truth. So we have a religion. We believe and follow things. God's desired that people worship him. That means a religion. Jesus raised up a church. This is why our religion is different from others. And historically speaking, this is why we know about a Feast of Tabernacles, a return of Christ, a millennial reign of 1,000 years that even historians and early church fathers said, well, sure. That's obviously what we all think and do until later. Now, as we progress, first century, second century, the early Catholic councils, Nicaea, Laodicea, <clears throat> and others. So we're aware, I won't go into all of that history, a church history, but we're aware, historically speaking, how philosophical and mystery religion ideas invaded the church from the second century onward by different Christian church fathers and philosophers and so on began to impact the original church. And things sounded Christian. They sounded biblical. But it began to gradually crowd out so many fundamental doctrines. The forces changing apostolic doctrine were really derived from Paganism, mystery religious ideas, sound very spiritual. So Christian theologians, they were influenced like from people like Plato and oh, other philosophers that go back to Greece and Rome and Greece and earlier, even Babylon. That began to lay a foundation for, for the doctrines, the creeds, uh, what became uh, infiltrated into mainstream Christianity. Mainstream Christianity adopted that. And as the church grew, it altered things to embrace more pagans. They're more comfortable with that. You, you fuse pagan symbols and dates and rituals to Christian ideas. Thus you have the holidays. You have things like Halloween, All, All Souls Day, and the eve of that. And November 1st was a, a, a religious day in the Catholic Church. And the eve before was All Hallows' Eve. Well, not anything in the Bible like that, but it was in our church. So all of this began to be made official in these Catholic councils. As I mentioned before, the Council of Nicaea, and Council of in and Chalcedon, and various, they, the church fathers gathered, argued. They weren't all in agreement, but then endorsed early on by Constantine and others, and that became the doctrine. And so many things were changed. Didn't have Passover anymore. <laughs> Didn't have Sabbath anymore. That was thrown out. Easter and Christmas and Sunday worship and saints going to heaven and all the, th all the things were solidified gradually, not overnight. Took some time. So we understand that in the church. We learn about that. We learned that's why our religion's different. We're not in mainstream Christianity. Some things are good. Some things they held on to, especially maybe even the more biblically oriented churches. Not all bad, but so many fundamental ideas resulted from this. And out went the millennium and Christ's return. That went too. Now, Edward Gibbon mentions, uh, again, in, in his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, the scanty and suspicious materials of ecclesiastical history seldom enable us to dispel the dark cloud that hangs over the first age of the church. It's just so very hazy. 
You don't find a clear historical record, the apostles, the early church, the book of Acts, on into the second century, on in, oh yeah, it's all very, it all gets murky. And then what emerges, wow, that looks different. Let me read some quotes to you. It's not as though the only people on earth that understand anything like this are, are those in, in the church of God. Uh, G.T. Purves says, post-apostolic writings are mixed with ideas foreign to apostolic Christianity. Well, you had what the early apostles wrote, then you had other church fathers later. Didn't, didn't sound like quite the same thing. The latter is unintentionally distorted and misrepresented. Eberhard Griesbach, in, in an academic lecture on Christianity and humanism, this was delivered way back in 1938, observed that in its encounter with Greek philosophy, Christianity became theology. That was the downfall of Christianity. It got distorted, got changed. G.A.T. Knight, many people today are far from understanding the basis of their faith. They just go to church. Where'd you, why are you doing that? <laughs> I don't know. That's what we do. Many people today are far from understanding the basis of their faith. Quite unwittingly, they depend upon the philosophy of the Greeks rather than upon the word of God for understanding. An instance of this is the prevailing belief among Christians in the immortality of the soul. Oh, a Greek idea there, and in, even prior to that in Babylonian religion. The Old Testament, which of course was the scriptures of the early church, has no word at all for the modern idea of the soul, meaning the immortal soul. There is one thing for sure we can say at this point, and that is that the popular doctrine of the soul's immortality cannot be traced back to the biblical teaching. Yeah, we know that. Jacques Ellul, these are, these are historians and philosophers and, and uh, some, uh, some theologians. We have to admit there's an immeasurable distance between all that we read in the Bible and the practice of Christianity. What an omission. There's a big gap, there's a big distance between what you read in the Bible and the practice of mo mainstream modern Christianity. Lord, there went the millennium out the window. Well, I'll read one more, uh, Norman Snaith. It's clear to us that there is often a great difference between Christian theology and biblical theology. Neither Catholic or Protestant theology is based on biblical theology. There can be no right answers until we have come to the clear view of the distinctive ideas of both Old and New Testaments and their difference from the pagan ideas which are so largely have dominated Christian thought. Wow, what, what, what an admission. What an evaluation of the main main Christian church down through history. Not to try to demean everybody that calls themselves a Christian and individual. This is just historical identification of, of what happened. So the millennium became a doctrine of the Antichrist. And later the church became the kingdom. Well, of course, it has rulers, it has people, and has a territory. The church was the kingdom. Oh, yeah, that... That makes sense. Or the kingdom lived in your heart. That was a part of it too. That's what happened to the millennium. Sort of like the Sabbath day. We've heard those are, uh, uh, every day is a Sabbath. Every day belongs to God. A Christian is at rest every day in Christ. So you kind of spiritualize the fourth commandment away. Sounds spiritual enough. Every day is a day of God. You're at rest in Christ. The resurrection at Christ's return was replaced by going to heaven. That's the most cherished belief, of course. What about these verses? Now, I'll just read these. You can think about, well, how would I ask? Somebody comes to me and believes in heaven. Well, what about Matthew 5, 12? Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. If your reward's in heaven, why would you want to be anywhere else? You'll miss your reward. It's up there waiting for you. 
What would you tell somebody who said that to you? Why, can't, why wouldn't you believe in that? Your reward's there. Don't you want to go get it? Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I didn't say theirs is the kingdom on earth. It's heaven. I mean, pretty, pretty plain if you believe in heaven, don't you? We're going right to the Bible. What do you tell somebody? Paul said in Philippians 1.23, I'm torn. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure which I prefer at this point, in this, part in, this time in my life. I'm in a strait between two. I have a desire to depart, to be with Christ. That's what he said. He wanted to leave this life and go up and be with Christ. He said it's far better than staying here and going through all the things I have and ministering to the church. Sounds like heaven to me. Jesus said, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you to myself, that where I am you may be. Where is he? In heaven. You can be there too. What would you tell somebody? In John 13, 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, where are you going? Well, we all know where he was going. Going to heaven. Jesus answered him, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you'll follow me later. Where did he go? Obviously ascended to heaven. Said, you're not going to be able to go right now, you'll come later. Sounds like heaven to me. So how would you talk to someone? What would you say to somebody? Points those out. And of course, the, the very popular Revelation 6-9 When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, the testimony. There there they are. Their soul, immortal soul, up in heaven. John saw them. Saw them there. So these are things that we're told, you know, we're, we're, we're told we're to be an example in how we live and be ready to give an answer for the hope. So as God's people, we have to be able to we don't know all answers to all, all scriptures, especially sometimes put on the spot, but yet we should be able to give an answer. Why don't these things tell us we're going to heaven? Of course, I'm, I'm not going to ta- wade through each one of these and you know, give a f- thorough answer uh, on each one of them. Obviously, Revelation 6-9 is just very simple. John is seeing something in vision. It's a vision. It's, it's teaching a thought and an idea. It's not a literal doctrinal explanation that you're getting from the Apostle Paul or one of the others about where everybody is. It's a, it's a vision in the book of Revelation, which is conveying an idea, not necessarily a, a literal a set of circumstances. Two witnesses, fire will come out of their mouth, he saw. Well, we doubt that fire is going to come out of anybody's mouth, literally things that represent other ideas. We lay up in heaven for ourselves treasure where moth does not, yes, that's where it's held. Our treasure is held, our our, uh, works are recorded. Jesus, where was Jesus going? Well, he was going to heaven, but he was going to eternal life. Where I go, I'm going to eternal life. You can't go now, you'll come later. He didn't say I'm going to go in heaven. When you die, you're going to come up there too. He didn't spell that out. Didn't explain that. So there's answers like 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Any doctrine, of course, you gather everything on it to determine what what you're convicted of. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but all unto all of them that love is appearing. So he's talking about a crown of righteousness, a reward that he receives at Christ's appearing, at his return. 
and he's coming to return to the earth. That's when he gets his reward. He's not in heaven saying, I'm waiting for my reward when Christ somehow comes back to the earth. Jesus said, marvel not, the hour is coming, all that are in the graves will hear his voice. That's where people are. They're in the graves. And then, of course, all the verse, 1 Corinthians 15, those that are asleep, it's the way the Bible likens death. 1 Thessalonians 4, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning those which are asleep. That's how the Bible likens death. There's no teachings about going to heaven. Uh, Mr. Armstrong used to Offer on his radio program $10,000. Find a verse that says we're going to heaven or people are in heaven or our loved ones are up there. It just isn't there. Some verses sound like that. But the teaching of the scriptures is clearly has to do with the resurrection. And why would we need to reunite with our body? Because people do teach a resurrection of the body. That, you can't escape that. But the soul is in heaven, and Christ will return, and the body will be reunited with the soul that's in heaven. We believe people are up in heaven, and they unite. Why? Why do you need that body? You've been up there in heaven without it for how, how long? What's it going to do for you? Why do you need a physical body? It, there's no, it makes no sense. But somehow you have to fit the two together. But that wouldn't make a great deal, great deal of sense. No, we're asleep in death. That's how the, the Bible likens it. So whatever happened to the millennium, that's, that's the basic story. But that's not only the story of the millennium. It's the story of the Christian church. It's the story of why our religion is different than other people. But the feast is not only knowing about physical history, is it? It's not just about knowing an answer to scriptures. It's about something deeper than that. It's the lesson we learn at the feast. One of them is that we're sojourners. That's how we look at our life. We, we're passing through this life. We're sojourning. We're not of this world. We're separate. We not only know different things, we live different way, a different way. We think differently than other people. Not just we know different doctrines. We have a different belief about what's coming in world history. 1 Peter 2.11. 1 Peter 2.11. I don't know. We did not have that theme in uh, New Braunfels as far as sojourners that I recall. At least that somebody had that as a focus of their message. So I'll mention it here. 1 Peter 2.11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims. Strangers, pilgrims, uh, pass your sojourning here in fear, it says. So abstain from things which are part of, the, part of the world. We're passing through, we're sojourning. This life is not our primary focus. And everything that's involved in the physical comforts of life. And we're temporary dwellers. One of the primary lessons of the Feast of Tabernacles. You live in temporary dwellings. That's one of the reasons for initiating, having these regional feast sites, picturing the world tomorrow. Temporary dwellings, a celebration of peace and, and <clears throat> what's coming to the world. Secondly, we're learning not only the physical elements about the millennium, we're learning to rule over ourselves. We're going to be rulers in the world tomorrow. We're learning to rule ourselves. That's not easy. How about Luke 16.10? Luke 16.10. We're learning to rule over ourselves. He that is faithful in Luke 16, 10, and that which is least is faithful in much. How are we going to be ruling? We read that scripture. We'll live and reign with Christ. 
How are we going to rule anybody? What do, I, what do we know about ruling any, anybody? Cities and, and peoples and <clears throat> towns or what have you. What do we know about any of that? Well, he that is faithful in least can be given much. You just apply the principle in a broader context. All fits. And he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. So we're given the opportunity to rule ourselves. And that, and that gives us all plenty to do. It gives us plenty on our plate. Never, never mind about somebody else ruling over others. We've got plenty to do in our own mind, our own lives. No, we're learning to rule over our lives, which was part of Mr. Um, Moody's message on Friday, on Wednesday, the last day of Feast of Tabernacles, seeking God's righteousness. The vision of the millennium and what we had was to motivate us, wasn't it? Motivate us to do what? Okay, we come home, we're motivated. Motivated to what? Plan where we're going next year or... Set aside more money so we have even more to spend. That's how we're motivated. No, and not just to pick. We didn't come home. We weren't motivated just to picture this world at peace. What a wonderful picture. It's more than that. We came home motivated to walk with God, didn't we? Hopefully so. Came home motivated to walk with God, which is to have his mind to worship him in his religion, what he's called us to do. A couple more scriptures, Deuteronomy 8 and verse 6, Deuteronomy 8, 6. Deuteronomy 8, 6, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and fear him. That's what we were motivated to do. Walk in his way. Game on my mind, I'm going to walk in that way better. And we said we went to learn the fear of the Lord, and that just means a, a stronger desire to respect that way, to live it, to make it our life. Walk in his ways. Walk in God's religion as he designed it. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we came home, we were inspired at the feast to learn to <clears throat> walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by faith of God's truth, not by just what we see and add up concretely in a physical contest, a context. Learning to walk by faith, we're ruling ourselves. Walking by faith, walking in God's religion, what he designed, not what mainstream Christianity has settled upon. And finally, John 17, 16 and 17, John 17, 16 and 17, Jesus' final prayer to his Father. John 17, 16, he says, they're not of the world. We can see why we're not. Our teachings, our doctrines, our religion, hopefully our spirit, our behavior, our attitude, they're not, they're not of the world. The world doesn't generate what we do. Something else motivates that. You're not of the world even as I am not of the world, so sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. We go by God's word. The truth guides us. God's spirit guides us. God's plan. God's religion. That's what directs us. That's what guides us. That's what the feast was about. Not just learning about how, how a 7,000 year plan unfolds. Isn't that nice? Or the world will be at peace. Well, that's a part of it. That's a vision, and that's important. But learning how to walk with God is why we came back with the thoughts that we did. So it's not only important to go to the feast, not only important to learn, well, whatever happened to the millennium? 
Why didn't everybody know about that? Why when we told the school or our job, oh, of course, the Feast of Tabernacles, that's right out of the Bible. But what? <laughs> Where are you going? Not only important to know whatever happened in the millennium or to go to the feast and learn about what's going to take place, but we have to live the meaning of the millennial feast and the meaning of God's coming kingdom.